No, listen, th thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, this has been an astounding conference. And my congratulations to the organizers and, and all the speakers gave uh, beautiful presentations. And uh, it, it was fantastic to participate in it. And uh, what's been really interesting also is to see how this has evolved over the past 30, 30 years plus uh, in terms of having more sophisticated thinking about the pathobiology the diversity of diseases that we're really talking about, that we've lumped together as PPHN and becoming more sophisticated about that and uh, learning more about the integrative physiology. And, uh, and so I think each of the speakers really spoke so beautifully about some of these choices and how these things come together. So thank you everybody. And uh, so I think there are many, many questions to raise. Um, you know, one thing that was not addressed that I'd like to ask the panel, overall is to start off with when often we're looking for biomarkers for pulmonary hypertension to complement what we do with echocardiogram and clinical features and, and, and radiologic features. What about the role of brain natriuretic peptide or NT pro BNP? Some people believe that it's a good screening approach uh, in lieu of echocardiograms in BPD infants. Earlier in the course, perhaps it's a, a, a factor that might help with the diagnostics, but how do you all in your clinical practice integrate your thinking about BMP as a blood biomarker with assessing the diagnosis, complementing what you're doing at the bedside and making some uh, decisions clinically? And uh, maybe I'll start with Patrick. I know Patrick has to leave fairly soon. So let's, what do you think, Patrick? Um. So let me answer the first part. We use BMP. We use BMP when we know what the problem is. Uh, so I think, I think BMP is helpful to kind of identify that there may be a concern, but it's not necessarily specific uh, to what the particular problem is. Most of our use of BMP is in the setting of chronic pulmonary hypertension. And I think it's important for people to recognize that anything that increases atrial ventricular loading conditions, whether it's on the right side or the left side, theoretically will increase BMP. And I think, you know, one of the, and you are, no one knows better than you, Steve, the, the chronic pulmonary hypertension patient population theoretically may have BMP elevated for more than one reason. So it may be your classic right heart disease, pulmonary vascular disease, but also there's increasing recognition of a left heart phenotype with systemic hypertension and so forth. And we've just submitted some data on that to PAS kind of over the, the past year with some echo characterization of those babies as well. So I think, you know, I think BMP is useful to say there's a problem. I think you need echo or CAT to say what the problem is. And then you use BMP to titrate response to therapy. That's how I would use it. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, another basic issue has to do with supplemental oxygen and FiO2, and uh, Satyan, once again, beautiful job. Uh, Satyan is the most amazing educator, teacher, illustrator, as well as savvy clinician and researcher, so thank you. But, but Satyan, when it comes to oxygen and how to think about it, I think you hit it on the head with the targets and a great rationale. But a couple of points I just wanted to, to raise for a little historical background. Part of the reason why I think there was such a tendency to linger with such high FiO2s and to so slowly wean the FiO2 was this concept called flip-flopping. And this goes back many, many years during my internship, even in pediatrics. And uh, the idea before we had a vasodilator, sometimes small changes in FiO2 would lead to dramatic hypoxia. And I think that's because the systemic and pulmonary pressures, they'd be right at the brink of being super systemic and even small dropping below systemic was enough to have big increases in pulmonary blood flow beyond what oxygen you know, itself might reflect or other kinds of things. But, I, but I'm wondering, Satyan, how should we think about even weaning FiO2 more aggressively based on the fact that we do have these vasodilators we do have ways of treating cardiac performance a little better. How should we think about more rapid weaning to avoid the uh, oxygen toxicities if you get anything further? 
Thanks, Steve. Thank you for the kind comment. I learned so much by listening to you. Your brief introduction was phenomenal, really loud it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, getting back to oxygen, I think the pendulum has gone in different directions so far. Uh, initially, during my fellowship in the 1990s, I can remember every single baby that I transported with CDH or PPHN had a PO2 of 220, and the number below 200 was suicidal, in my opinion, because <laughs> of the same flip-flop that you mentioned. Flip-flop is a wonderful term to indicate how dynamic these babies are. Uh, and nurses did not want to see any number below 99 in these instances, so they aimed for high SATs all the time. And we have seen several negative effects of that. And right now, until we hopefully get automated FiO2 control, hopefully that will become the norm in the next decade or so, that will really help us out. In the meantime, the support trial has clearly, and, and the neoprom trials in preterm infants have clearly shown that a narrow target range is very difficult for nurses to maintain. So we do need a slightly wider target range. And that's the reason why I use 90 to 97 while managing babies with TPHN so that it makes it easy for the nurse to target these numbers. So how fast should we be? I do not know the answer to that question. I mean, anytime I see a number above 98, I turn the FIO2 down. The question is how much should you turn down? That's not an easy answer either. Um, if I have a PAO2 wall value, I use the rule of seven and figure out the FIO2, PAO2 relationship based on that and turn the oxygen down based on that. Uh, but using SATs, it's a tricky thing to do. And I usually go down by 5% every time I can and, and stand by the bedside till the baby is stable. But lability is the hallmark of PPHN. And these babies are born to give us more gray hair or loose hair, whatever the situation might be. <laughs> and uh, uh, they really tend to be quite taxing to care for. The part that concerns me, which is open for debate is targeting 85 to 95 in some babies. And the reason I wanted to put that up is because if you're already on 100% O2, it's perfectly fine to tolerate 85% saturation in this baby. On the other hand, if you're on, I have seen some instances where young fellows tend to keep the baby in 25% O2 and, and the baby is saturating 89%. And that's the part that gets me a little concerned where give them adequate FiO2 to make sure that there is enough allular oxygen to mediate pulmonary vasodilation. So just like everything, things done in moderation work best in pediatrics and a moderate amount of oxygen is probably needed. And as you have shown better than anybody else, that uh, giving adequate oxygen, especially for BPD babies, is really important for their own growth and development. And so oxygen is a vital thing as long as it's done in moderation. Great, thank you. Wonderful answer. And Dr. Levy, Phil, again, great job. And so great to see you. Um, I, I want to ask you, you've done such a wonderful job pointing out the persistence of pulmonary vascular disease long after NICU discharge and perhaps even other traditional metrics of echocardiographic uh, signs of pH have resolved. What do you think we should be doing with that population as we evolve from the infant that you've just discharged from your nursery? What would you say to the pediatricians, to cardiologists following them or pulmonologists? Or what would you say to adults who are about to take on your population, your cohort? How should we think about them and manage them differently to avoid the issue of cardiovascular disease across the lifespan as best as one can now? Thanks, Steve. That's an excellent question. And uh, again, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to talk here today. So I think a lot of work is ongoing by our group, by a group in Oxford led by Adam Lewandowski and group in Wisconsin and now Texas led by Karagos where you have these former preterm individuals who become one year of age, six years of age, 18 years of age and 25 years of age. And we are learning that clinically the way they look, they, they look like any person who was born term for the most part, but they are at risk with each subsequent insult and injury to have a unique uh, kind of phenotypical presentation. And it could be presenting either as heart failure, as pulmonary hypertension, it could be systemic hypertension, it could be failed exercise uh, tolerance tests. So what Cara 
uh, in Texas and Adam in Oxford and myself in Boston are advocating for is the identification. Again, it's very similar to how we're screening for, for pulmonary vascular disease and pulmonary hypertension. You identify the population. So it could be babies born less than 32 weeks or less than 28 weeks. Did they have some degree of pulmonary vascular, cardiac, or lung disease in the neonatal period? And then you have to ask yourself, how do you want to screen them? You know, with pulmonary hypertension, we've talked a lot about echocardiography. We've talked a lot about uh, um, uh, invasive cardiac catheterization in the appropriate centers. But as these kids get older, we're talking about a potential visit to the cardiologist, a potential visit to these experts in preterm physiology. We're talking about potential exercise tolerance tests. We're talking about a potential um, echocardiogram at some point during childhood or early adulthood. There's been talk about potential biomarkers, as Steve has, has alluded to. So the point I'm making is that you're identifying the population, you're identifying the comorbidities to give you a sense of their risk factors, and then you're identifying what are the tests that you could use to follow these uh, former preterm individuals. What we don't want, because as neonatology has changed over the last 30 years, and Dr. Arjiva perfectly alluded to this, is that we are intubating less children. We have improved surfactant administration. We have improved pulmonary vasodilator medications, improved nutrition and improved ventilatory strategies. And what the former preterm infant, how they look when they're 30 and 40, we just don't know yet because they haven't yet turned 30 and 40. But when they do, we don't want to be blindsided um, to any of the potential phenotypes. And then it goes back to what Patrick was alluding to is once we're able to potentially identify these adults born preterm who are at risk to have these phenotypes, is there some modifiable intervention that we could employ during the neonatal period as most of us are neonatologists caring for these babies? So I would uh, advocate that we are learning that there are. Um, nutrition is probably the number one most effective uh, uh, intervention in the neonatal period and maternal breast milk. And we are learning that as we give maternal breast milk, we may not be able to completely fix the preterm cardiac phenotype, but we may able to normalize it almost to the extent of these term-born individuals. And we're learning that preterm infants who get breast milk have improved lung function, improved pulmonary vascular function, and improved cardiac function, both at a year of age, but all the way out to 25 years of age. So I think it's a whole spectrum of things that we can look for, things that we can test and things that we can modify. And thank you again for the invitation to be here today. Thank you, Phil, that was a great response. So in addition to progenitor cells, mother's milk may be the answer, huh? <laughs> okay, good. Um, so uh, Dr. Rajiv, wonderful talk on sildenafil. I think uh, one of the questions that often comes up is how early can one feel comfortable giving it to a premature baby? because we know there are proangiogenic effects of sildenafil. We know that uh, it could stimulate vascular endothelial growth factor production, which, which I happen to think is a good thing. But if one were an ophthalmologist, you say, well, hold on, you know, maybe not so fast. What's happening in the eyeball? What's happening with retinopathy of prematurity? Uh, is there a downside of early initiation that we should be concerned about or, or how we use it in a different fashion because of these uh, perhaps, um, we'll call them hidden dangers. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, okay, I leave the open to the floor, but I, I think all the studies which point in oral signal filler after 40 uh, weeks post-menstrual age or the child is crossed into 34-35 weeks uh, thing when the pulmonary hypertension gets into a reasonably assessment level. I think that time it, it may not be detrimental to the retina, to the growing retina. But before 40 weeks post-menstrual age, I'd be cautious to use uh, syndrome. I want everybody's comment on this. You know, I want to, even I want to learn that that cutoff is reasonable or is it evidence-based or what are we doing with this? Great. Pa Patrick, what are your thoughts about that? About uh, how early is, is safe in your mind and are you, how early do you use it in your own practice, let's say? In terms of uh, sildenafil? 
In terms of sildenafil, being in a place that has nitric oxide readily available and other things too, can modify it. But how does that affect your thinking about it? Yeah, so here, obviously, you know, we, we clearly differentiate acute and chronic pulmonary hypertension. So as, as an acute intervention, we yes. would probably not use nitric oxide given we have, or sorry, not sildenafil, given that we, we have nitric oxide and for the most part, it works well. If we have nitric oxide non-responders, we tend to go down other different pathways. Um, however, in the setting of infants that have chronic pulmonary vascular disease, um, I think there's, there's two types of situations we use it. Number one, in infants that perhaps are mechanically ventilated, um, and assuming we're not going to the cat lab, we may give a trial of nitric oxide first to demonstrate clinical benefit. And then if we see a response to nitric oxide, whether at five parts or higher, we would then transition the babies to sildenafil. For non-intubated babies who have chronic pulmonary vascular disease, um, our typical first line approach to them is just as what Phil described earlier, fix the things that can be fixed first that are potentially non-pulmonary vascular. And I think if you're left with someone who still has kind of evidence of pulmonary hypertension, uh, we, would, we would start with sildenafil as our first line therapy as well. Um, luckily at Iowa, our numbers of chronic pulmonary hypertension are low. Now that's a whole other discussion as to why that is given kind of the large numbers of tiny, tiny babies that are surviving. But I think it comes down to kind of the meticulous approach we have to both respiratory and cardiovascular care. I think we're ending up with a, a low number of babies with this disease, which, which is, 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 is good. So I, does that answer your question, Steve? Yeah, I think that's right on target. It opens the door for some other issues as well. I, I, I would like to talk about some of the factors uh, in severe BPD for example. And as uh, Phil mentioned, we now think about it in different phenotypes in terms of what's going on respiratory-wise. Central airway, parenchymal, and vascular is three components. I would throw in the medium-sized airways that are long overlooked uh, beyond the tracheomalacia issue. Still central is what's going on in those other airways and how lung volumes impact that, but that's a whole nother discussion. But I guess my question for the group, maybe I'll ask Satya on first. You have a baby in the, your NICU with severe ventilator-dependent BPD, and you have a, a, a child with pulmonary hypertension. Uh, can you tell me how you think about what we, well, number one, why do you think we don't see pulmonary hypertension in all of these kids? We see it in a 50% or more, right? But why not 100% if there is this one-to-one -one relationship? What, what's going on with that is one question from your research questions as well. And then finally, at the bedside, how do you tackle that ventilator-dependent kiddo who has pH by echo in terms of what you do? That's a tough question, Steve. These are the most difficult patients to manage. I'm sorry, it's a little loud here. Uh, so ventilator-dependent patients, especially somebody coming close to 36, 37 weeks, corrected gestation, still stuck on a ventilator with high settings, with echocardiographic evidence of pulmonary hypertension is a huge challenge to manage. I think as you have pointed out in many of your earlier talks, optimizing ventilation with the BPD settings using adequate PEEP, uh, adequate uh, fairly large tidal volumes with long I times with long E times is probably the first step to take. But we do monitor these patients very closely with their cardiograms to see what kind of treatment is needed. Why don't all of them develop pulmonary hypertension? That's a great question. I'm sure there is some phenotypic background here where the vasculature in some babies is more reactive than others. Um, the, the, those babies that trouble me the most are former IUGR infants who were born at 600 grams at 28 weeks or something like that. And they have some unique phenotype where they develop significant eye disease, ROP with BPD, with pulmonary hypertension, creating a lot of concern in their management. So no easy answer to this question. Um, one thing I beg to partly, slightly that we do differently than what Patrick mentioned, if you have such a baby with significant pulmonary hypertension with rapidly progressing ROP, 
we do use inhaled nitric oxide in those patients just to make sure that the RV afterload is reduced. And uh, we don't use sildenafil till the eye gets a little better. It's a slight difference in practice here. And I'm also a bit concerned about a question you brought up earlier regarding the use of Avastin and Lucent in the anti-VEGF agents. We had a couple of babies who are IUGR who had mild pulmonary hypertension on echo, but following two doses of Avastin had a slight increase in their pulmonary pressure requiring need to initiate inhaled nitric oxide. And there are some papers suggesting that there are serum levels that you can measure for these inhibitors that can be elevated following an inter intravitreal injection. So there are so many things that we need to learn with this condition. And I think uh, symposia such as like this raise more questions and stimulate more research. And that's the fun here. Well, thank you. Yes. And in fact, when we think of our animal models, just a single dose of a drug that inhibits VEGF is sufficient to cause severe pulmonary hypertension, alveolar simplification that persists even into adulthood. And so it's remarkable, this, this important window that neonatologists you all know about in the NIC, that window in so many avenues is so vital to better understand. So I think it's a great point. Yeah. So, so Phil, tell me, how do you think about the interplay of systemic disease affecting the lung circulation? For example, necrotizing enterocolitis is strongly associated with perhaps worse risks in some papers for pH, but also for, for things like pulmonary vein stenosis and certainly worsening their ventilatory course. And, and so how does the, uh, how do the systemic disease change your thinking in your approach diagnostically and in terms of management for uh, the, the sick, sick preterm in your NICU? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I think it goes back to uh, identifying the comorbidities, as you mentioned, a baby who has lung disease, but also could have necrotizing enterocolitis and also uh, develop retinopathy of prematurity, potentially linked, as you very well know, through the VEGF signaling mechanisms. But I think, you know, uh, uh, I always learned from Alan Job that uh, some of these children can live in this inflammatory state and uh, how the inflammatory milieu impacts the lungs and the gut and the brain is important to consider when you're talking about the treatment options. And, it, and as everybody on this call very well knows, when we're treating bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we're trying to optimize nutrition and minimize ventilatory support. And there's good data with, with diuretic use and fluid management. But really, it always comes back to the, the steroid question. And steroids could be asked in terms of acute pulmonary hypertension and, near, and, and, and late pulmonary hypertension but really trying to understand how it impacts the inflammatory milieu. So I think that's a whole kind of spectrum you have to consider, but to really get specific on pulmonary vein stenosis, I think it's really interesting to understand that pulmonary vein stenosis in that paradigm that we talked about of impacting either pulmonary vascular resistance or pulmonary blood flow or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, where pulmonary vein stenosis falls in that late or chronic neonatal pulmonary hypertension, we are learning that pulmonary vein stenosis presents late in, in, in our preterm infants. And oftentimes it's in those children that are either severely growth restricted or have a large left to right shunt, maybe a VSD or persistent PDA, but there seems to be something else. There seems to be chronic lung disease or retinopathy of prematurity or necrotizing enterocolitis. And I don't know if we can go as far as to say that they're all associated, but there's definitely some type of link. So when you put that open. all together, these are just identifying kind of the risk factors and the inflammatory markers and, and how we identify this. The whole point of a conference like this is we want to identify, we want to identify risk factors earlier so we can have prevention strategies that begin from ventilation, nutrition, down to pulmonary vasodilator. So I think it's the whole milieu and inflammatory component is an important piece of that. Well, thank you very much, uh, doctors. I think we are up with that time. So there are a few unanswered questions. So I promise uh, viewers that I will get the answers from the speakers and the panelists and I will mail back to you, which are the questions which have been not answered. Uh, so I would like to invite Dr. Deepu to give the closing remarks. One, one minute, uh, one minute. Patrick wanted to say something. Okay, he's saying bye, okay. Uh, Deepu, please. Uh, You are mute, doctor. Thank you very much for 
all the brilliant speakers for such a great session today. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, for organizing such a great event. I know the amount of work and, 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 and pain you have put into organizing this great event. And Taufik, thank you again uh, for being such a well-coordinated, uh, super program as always for us. And a, a special thanks to all the dynamic IAP Emirates members, Dr. Sridhar and, and the whole rest of the team from myself and on behalf of uh, Sulega Hospitals. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. It will be great to have a video a copy of this uh, whole conference. Many people yes, are asking for it. I will be sharing the link with you. That will be great. Yes. Thank you. The audience are asking for Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody. It will be shared with all the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.